Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third webinar in the second Global Summit on Food Fortification virtual series, focusing on fortifying the supply chain and addressing premix challenges. We are delighted to welcome you to the conversation today, which has been put together for you all by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the Micronutrients Forum, Harvest Plus, BASEF, Hexagon Nutrition, and Stern Vitamin Mullen Gamey. This webinar is being live streamed on the GAIN website and on the YouTube channel. We want this to be a dynamic conversation, so please put your questions to the speakers in the Q&A, and we will do our best to direct them to our brilliant speakers during the panel discussion later today. In addition, I would like to inform you that this webinar will be live translated into Portuguese and French, and you can access the translations through the link that I have been provided now in the chat function. We also have Josh Nollis, a live illustrator who is joining us today, and he will be illustrating this webinar. And I will ask Josh to show the illustration at several points so we can clearly see the challenges and opportunities and to get your reflections. Welcome, Josh. Hello, hi there, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So today we're talking um, about supply chain challenges in large-scale food fortification and the latest Lancet series on maternal and child undernutrition that was released last month clearly demonstrated that the world has not made sufficient progress in reducing vitamin and mineral deficiencies. An estimated 2 billion people worldwide suffer from micronutrient deficiencies and this number is likely to grow as a result of the COVID pandemic. Large-scale food fortification is one of the ready-to-scale, cost-effective interventions to tackle micronutrient malnutrition. However, a lack of sustainable, efficient, and cost-effective supply chains is one of the challenges that are faced in the scale-up of this intervention. So over the last two decades, the premix industry has evolved to meet the challenges of supplying premixes to countries in support of their um, fortification programs and ensuring that staple foods can be fortified. Yet the COVID-19 crisis has caused an unprecedented global crisis with severe impacts on the lives of the most vulnerable. Efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19 have disrupted food systems and global trade. Lockdown and quarantine strategies to mitigate the spread of the virus and their concurrent economic impacts have made nutritious foods less affordable and less accessible, driving up global hunger and malnutrition. And the fortification supply chain itself has also been impacted by the pandemic. Challenges experienced by premix suppliers and fortified food producers include foreign exchange shortages, limited sources for some of the raw materials, making the supply chain vulnerable to disruptions, concentrations of premix suppliers in just a few uh, geographic areas, and huge increases in air freight costs and shipping costs and container shortages due to COVID-related trade imbalances. So today we will discuss how to address vulnerabilities in the premix supply chain to make it more resilient to external shocks. We will discuss the actions which vitamin and mineral producers and premix blenders can take to ensure a reliable, affordable supply of vitamin and mineral premixes to support fortification programs in low and middle income countries. And we will discuss ways to protect local access to premixes, especially by small and medium sized producers of fortified staple foods. We have an excellent lineup of speakers today that will, that will illustrate <coughs> these challenges uh, and, and the lessons learned with you. And we will have a Q&A uh, discussion at the end of this webinar. I would now like to introduce you to our first speaker, Leo schultz van Boer. Leo is the manager of food fortification and partnerships at Mühlengemi Stern Vitamin, based in Hamburg, Germany. And he is responsible for the company's micronutrient premix range, addressing malnutrition, and the technical assistance offered to mills and organizations working on food fortification. He will give an overview about how premix suppliers work, how they are dealing with current risks in the supply chain, and how to reduce risks in the future. Leo, over to you. Yeah, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the webinar also from my side. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Saskia. And yeah, I would like to speak today about the uh, uh, supply chain for micronutrient premixes. 
what are the risks that we are facing and how can we handle um, these risks. But I would like to start with a short overview about how the premix industry um, actually works, especially for those viewers um, that are maybe not that familiar with the processes behind uh, large scale food fortification. So generally, when a, when a food fortification program is introduced in a certain country, the staple food producers are required to add a set of micronutrients um, to their food product. So typically that could be um, iron, folic acid, vitamin A, zinc, and other micronutrients. Um, and then in theory, the food producers could buy all these ingredients separately. But um, what often makes more sense um, is to buy a combination of the, the micronutrients by premix. Um, and that's where the premix supplier then um, comes into play. So our job is uh, really to source these uh, individual micronutrients from the different sources, test the ingredients, um, make sure that they're really suitable for food fortification in terms of um, stability, uh, in terms of uh, really ruling out any impacts on the um, final food product and um, making sure um, that it really works well in the, in the um, end product. Um, and then next step would be to blend all these ingredients into, um, into a, a workable product that's easy to use for the mill. So that could mean, for example, adding some carrier that makes it easier to dose um, in, the, in the processes of the food producer. Um, and then also if a food producer works with a quality premix supplier, they should also be able to help with the implementation and know the end application and be able to um, really um, support with the implementation of the, the fortification and the, in the end product. Um, so how does our supply chain um, look like? Um, basically, as we as the premium supplier would source the ingredients from, from different vitamin manufacturers and mineral manufacturers um, across the globe. Typically, that could be uh, Europe, that could be Asia. Um, and then we would blend the premix in one of our sites. For example, our main site is in um, Germany. And then the next step, ship it out to our customers that are really spread out um, over the globe, uh, basically in every country that has a, a food fortification problem. So the supply chain really uh, is a global one. So there's a lot of logistics involved. There are a lot of different countries involved with diff uh, different uh, political environments. Um, and therefore, a situation like we've now seen with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that will, of course, have a strong impact on these uh, supply chains. So we've seen uh, closed borders. We also had shutdowns in um, some countries. We had a reduced workforce due to some um, COVID measures. Um, so of course it will have an, that will have an um, impact. But also normal times, um, the availability of certain micronutrients can be impacted uh, by maybe an incident or production or, or other um, factors. And these are things that we can really only influence um, in a very limited way. So in the end, we have to find ways to, to handle it and um, to really safeguard our own supply chain against such um, disruptions. Um, and one thing that we do to ensure we, we are still able to produce is to have a broad supplier base in the sense of really having a backup option um, in case there should be problems in the one or the other country or with a um, certain supplier, we still have another option to get our ingredients and still produce on time. Um, and another very important factor for us is to work with um, quality ingredient suppliers. So that's, of course, on the one hand, very relevant for the product quality, but also when it comes to reliability of supply. Um, it's, it's an important factor. Um, if you work with a quality producer, you can have much more confidence uh, and then really fulfilling the contracts and being uh, able to ship your product um, in time and have it in um, production. Um, and then when we look at our own uh, production, um, for us, it's important at uh, Stern Vitamin Munchi Me to have a um, global production network with a whole set of different options to produce a premix. Um, so I mentioned already our main production site is in Germany, but we would also have options to produce, for example, in uh, China, in Malaysia, in Mexico, uh, and other countries around the globe. Of course, generally we aim to supply a region always from the closest uh, production site. But in case there should be options like, uh, so it should be incidents like in the worst case, maybe something like a, like a shutdown, we would still have a chance to shift the production um, to another country and supply our customers um, from there. Then when it comes to logistics side, 
and really shipping the products out to our customers in the different um, geographies. Um, we really have long-term partnerships with our um, transport companies that we work with, and that gives us really good good service, and and they really um, yeah work work well together for, with us to make sure that our products reach the the customers in time, even in difficult situations like uh, we face now with the with the COVID pandemic. Um, and overall, I can say that this uh, worked very well for us during COVID. So far, of course, the pandemic is also still um, ongoing. We had some delays um, also here and there, but overall, we were very um, happy with how it worked. We were able to fulfill our contracts and supply um, all our customers also um, in this phase. And if we now look at the future, um, this is really the way we want to, to keep going, of, of course, expand also um, our network and be even more resilient um, in the future. Um, and apart from these things that the, the premix industry can do for their own supply chain, um, there are also options um, maybe on the regulation side um, of food fortification. Yeah, that can be influenced by governments and by um, organizations working on food fortification. Um, and one big factor I'd like to mention is the stronger harmonization um, of premixes. Uh, at the moment, we have a situation that almost every country um, has its own fortification premix. Um, and if we can find a way to, to align more in a meaningful way, that could give us a lot more um, flexibility and a lot more options to, to um, supply. Of course, every country has a different situation with regard to micronutrient deficiencies, and there's no point in having a one-size-fits-all premix. Um, but I think there's still a lot of potential where we can align maybe in specific regions and just gain efficiency by that for, for the supply chains and, and by that for large-scale food fortification um, as a whole. So just to summarize, um, the, the supply chain for um, micronutrient premixes really is a global one. That means it's really subjected to a situation as we have seen with COVID now. Um, but there are possibilities to deal with that, which is working with quality suppliers, having backup options, and having a broad global um, production network to react to, to uh, problems and be able to shift productions if, if need be. Yeah, that's it from my side uh, for now, and I'm looking forward to uh, your questions later on in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, for setting the scene and for, um, uh, for illustrating that the micronutrient premix is truly a global, uh, global supply chain, uh, which makes it vulnerable, but there are also actions that can be taken at the side of the producer, as you illustrated, by ensuring a broad supply uh, base, by ensuring a quality ingredient um, uh, suppliers and having multiple production sites, but also uh, on the receiving end by uh, making sure that there's maybe perhaps stronger harmonization um, um, of premixes and uh, of standards for premixes. So thank you very much for, um, for setting the scene here. And we now move to our next speaker, who is Klaus Sundergaard. Klaus is the Global Application Specialist on Food Fortification and Technical Marketing at BASEF. And since 1985, he has worked in the food ingredient industry for Danish food ingredient companies like Danisco, Danish Sugar and Chris Hansen within development and application technology. Klaus, in his presentation today, will focus on supply chain activities that have a direct impact on the quality and potency of the micronutrients, especially uh, focusing on vitamin A. Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, present in this, uh, in this webinar today. So um, I'm really looking forward also to the coming seminars. Um, now, I hope you can see my, my first slide here. Uh, a, a few words about BSF. Uh, our products and solutions are used in almost all industries. BSF is active around in 90 countries and employs more than 110,000 people worldwide. We combine economic success, uh, environmental protection, and social responsibility. That is, for example, in BSF, we do not uh, know the word waste because what is a byproduct in one production is raw material in the next production. So everything is linked together. So there's uh, no waste, which is a, a huge environmental um, victory, you can say. Um, so it's important 
important that we live our corporate purpose by sourcing and producing responsibly, acting as fair and reliable partner, and connecting creative minds to find the best solution for the market. For all, that is what successful business is all about. Next, please. Some challenges. Um, here we have the, let's say, the fortification world. In the box at the left side, we have the BSF uh, factory or the BSF Verbund, as we call it. So we are sourcing the raw material, uh, fully controlled over the whole synthesis process to the pure vitamin A oil that then goes into our formulation plant uh, where everything is uh, formulated uh, throughout uh, development and research to make product that meets the application needs. For example, what is good in tablets, it's maybe not good in, uh, in flour or sugar, for example. So what is very uh, important is the stability because stability goes down to the very first steps. The potency, of course, must be maintained. Packaging is uh, important to maintain uh, freshness and the potency throughout the shelf life. And of course, a full uh, traceable QAQC system that is important. So what comes out of the factory is the vitamin A. So it goes to our storage houses. And, and during this, depending on the time, of course, uh, storage and transportation, there could be uh, a few losses uh, because we are trying to illustrate the losses also of vitamin A. And that is because vitamin A is one of the most sensitive of all vitamins. Uh, it has to be sensitive to work in our body. So uh, therefore we have to do something to protect it. Next step is uh, the filling or production in our customers. Uh, during this production step, there could be some, uh, there could be some challenging uh, setting up uh, the right, uh, the right setup in the factory, supporting the factory with uh, every information about the product, the handling, and everything. After filling, it goes uh, to our customers' warehouse. And when I say our customers, it can either be uh, a premixer for the powders that are making premix for for flour for any other application, or it could also be an oil mill where we are then supplying directly to the mill. The transportation then, uh, storage and transportation of the finished goods, uh, normally that is short. At the end of the day, it ends up in the kitchen somewhere where it's cooked. And this is where we see the biggest losses, the cooking losses of the vitamin A. So what is interesting for us is, of course, how much is left from the beginning until it ends up in the stomach of the consumer. So we are doing what we can to protect the vitamin A on the whole way from the first piece of raw material until yeah, it ends up in the stomach of the consumer. Next one, please. This is how we have different spheres around the product. First of all, we have the product solution, as I mentioned, with development of products that can fulfill the needs, that have good stability, that is easy in use, and, and many and all these factors. But around the product solution, we also have technical application solution where we support customers uh, and our yeah our customers with uh, how uh, information how to how to handle it in production, how to set it up in production, and all about the product itself, storage, transportation, and, and all these things. There are many, many questions around the product. The next sphere around this is the partnership solution, because we, uh, we have many, many partnerships around with NGOs, with the local, uh, with local uh, governments, with the uh, international organizations and, and universities. So we are also part of this. So this is what we also can bring together with, uh, with the product. And the last sphere around everything 
is the capacity building of QAQC because without any successful QAQC system, the, the fortification will not be a success. That is clear, we have seen that. So we are supporting also with, uh, with methods of analysis, quick tests, analytical methods, uh, also to build up QAQC system at our customers. And also we talk with, uh, with governments around because there could be some challenging in, in, in how to analyze the, the final product. So the product and all this goes into oil, flour, rice, sugar, bouillon cube fortification. So this is the whole way from, from beginning to the end. So I think that is uh, my words and I hope there will be many questions. So I will leave it to the next one, please. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you very much for uh, keeping to the time. And I would just like to remind everyone that you can uh, submit your questions in the Q&A chat where they will be uh, answered either live or we will um, address these questions at the panel discussion at the end of, the, of this webinar. So we will not have uh, questions now, um, but you can, you can address them in the, in the Q&A chat. Um, so we will now move to our next speaker, uh, who is Mr. Fikram Kalkar, and he is the Group Managing Director of Hexagon Nutrition, uh, with more than a decade of experience in the nutrition industry. Fikram in his presentation will focus um, on, uh, on the challenges and the actions that, uh, that we can take to strengthen access to quality micronutrient premixes throughout the developing world uh, during and post the COVID pandemic and particularly focusing on the situations in Asia and Africa. Fikram, over to you. Thank you very much, Saskia. A pleasure to be here on this forum on the occasion of the World Health Day. So uh, yeah, as my uh, presentation uh, title is uh, Key Challenges and Actions Taken to Strengthen Access to Quality Micronutrient Premix Throughout the Developing World uh, During and Post COVID-19 Pandemic in Asia and Africa. Next slide, please. Yeah, so about Hexagon Nutrition, uh, in brief, um, so we are a 30 year old company having sales in more than 70 countries across the globe with a strong focus on research and development. And uh, we have got ability to analyze the premixes and the products as well. Thank you very much. Next one. Yeah, uh, so uh, the Hexagon Nutrition Company works across three business verticals. First is the micronutrient formulations and premixes, followed by the clinical nutrition and also the therapeutic foods. We have uh, factories across uh, India um, at three locations and a dedicated R&D center uh, with all the certification and accreditations. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at the challenges for the premix industry in Asia and Africa. Next slide. So uh, let's go to the start of the pandemic. And uh, if we see the operational challenges, um, you know, with production, we did face production constraints in the initial months of the pandemic, since there was a lockdown announced. And even though we come under the essential product sector, there was a lack of clarity within the government departments on what is essential and what is not. After following the strict norms of social distancing, we worked with limited manpower in production and other departments for the first few months and eventually we were back on schedule. As far as challenges for the supply chain, after the COVID outbreak was announced in China during early 2020, the Indian government with a view to ensure supplies for the country had placed temporary export restrictions on several products including three vitamins which eventually after representation from the industry were taken off the list. After lockdown announcement in India, the import cargo was getting piled up at ports, resulting in delays and demurrages, and occasional stockout situation was faced at the plant. As far as logistics is concerned, even now the industry at large is facing problems with getting the containers for shipments and one has to wait for weeks or months before we get a container. There is multiple fold increase in the cost of sea freight and air freight something that we haven't seen in the past. As far as payments are concerned, uh, we had situations with uh, certain customers in Africa where they weren't able to pay on time, though the intent was there, but the COVID lockdown situation in their respective countries 
was a challenge for few months. Even now, uh, certain countries in Africa are facing a shortage of foreign exchange, resulting in delays. As far as Customer Connect is concerned, we were used to seeing our customers often, but due to the pandemic and travel restrictions, we couldn't meet them for months. The regulators, the national regulators also had some challenges during the pandemic. There were challenges faced by the authorities of some countries in Asia and Africa in enforcing compliance to regulatory standards of fortification. Even a country like Indonesia, which has been fortified for fortifying their flour for nearly two decades, had relaxed the mandatory fortification of flour for almost an year during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, let's come on to the actions uh, taken and the recommendations to overcome the challenges. Next slide, please. So by the premix supplier, uh, the important part is the availability or, and maintaining the long-term in uh, inventory of key ingredients and also collaborating with your dependable suppliers. A long-term relationship with suppliers is as important as that with your customers. Today, Hexagon has got a strategic partnership with a leading producer of vitamins in the world with commitments on both sides. Then uh, coming to the stock and sale in destination markets, with a view to serve our customers better, Hexagon is active in maintaining stocks of premixes in several countries in Asia and Africa through our network of distributors and our wholly owned subsidiaries as well. Then make in concept. The traditional strategy of seeking economies of scale by concentrating production at a few large facilities should be reviewed again. Instead, companies should look to serve the global markets with a network of smaller, geographically distributed regional factories that are more resistant to disruption. I am pleased to inform that Hexagon has initiated the action on starting its first overseas production facility outside India. Next slide, please. And uh, let's have a look uh, what should be done by the customers and what is being done as well. So uh, maintaining stocks of uh, safety stocks of premix. So safety stock like any other uh, stock carries with it the risk of obsolescence and also ties up the cash flow. It runs counter to the popular practice of just in time replenishment and lean inventories. But the savings from those practices have to be weighed against the costs of disruption, including lost revenues, the higher prices that we would have to be paid for materials that are suddenly in short supply and the time and effort that would be required to secure them. Then uh, enter into long-term contracts. Time has come for the medium-sized producers to enter into long-term contracts for the supplies of premixes, which will give them the comfort of timely supplies as well as hedge the risk of price volatilities. Then virtual connect attending webinars and virtual meetings with suppliers. The corona pandemic has taught the world that no matter how big or small the country or the person is, everyone is affected in some way or the other and life is going to change. What we were doing until yesterday is becoming irrelevant. There is a new normal now. For example, this Zoom uh, webinar which we are having is certainly one of the best way to connect efficiently while conserving the costs. Customers have now started engaging on webinars and virtual meetings with suppliers, thereby overcoming the challenge of routine physical meetings. Next slide, please. So this is going to be my last slide. Um, what are the recommendations and what are the steps taken by the national regulators? So uh, enhancing the testing and monitoring capabilities. National regulators should strongly emphasize on building capabilities by both premix suppliers as well as food industries for testing the premixes as well as the levels of vitamins present in fortified foods. The ex accredited external laboratories should have a robust and validated methodology for testing the fortified foods. Uh, I am proud to say that with the support of BASF, some of our customers in India have now access to the semi-quantitative test kits to analyze the level of vitamin A in the premix and the fortified edible oil. Then collaboration between government agencies and the private sector. This is becoming very important now and we do see this happening. Finally, uh, encourage local production and import substitution wherever possible. 
Developing local capacities and capabilities is the need of the hour. There has to be an emphasis on investing in the country rather than relying only on imports. For example, in India, we have the Make in India initiative promoted by our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi. So with that, uh, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Fikram, and thank you for um, illustrating specific, the specific challenges faced during the COVID uh, pandemic and also by reminding us that our world will not be the same anymore after this, uh, the, after this crisis and as a result of this crisis. And that this crisis has also provided us with new opportunities, including these, uh, these virtual uh, webinars to, to connect. Um, so we will now hear from Adeline Profond. Uh, who is the program manager for the GAIN Premix facility. And the GAIN Premix facility, or GPF, is a procurement platform within GAIN that helps food producers source the vitamins and minerals that they need to fortify their products. Today, Adeline is going to talk about the impact that the COVID crisis has had on the GPF activities, and more specifically, in the supply chain systems of, for food fortification programs. Adeline. Thank you, Saskia. Hello, everyone. Yes, I've worked for the GAIN Premix facility or the GPF for a few years. And the last 12 months have been quite a roller coaster. When I look back, I see three challenges in the supply chain crisis on Premix supply over the last year. The crisis created problems in terms of production, shipping, and container shortages. For me, the first challenge of the crisis started with an email. Early February 2020, a Chinese supplier told me that they were closing down their production line because of this new virus. This, they told me, was temporary. We had a few orders with them, but they assured us that they would be shipped by mid-March after the, new, um, the Chinese New Year holiday. And they kept their word. As the rest of the world started to panic, China resumed exports. The second challenge came up shortly afterwards when we started noticing disruptions. Many countries went into strict lockdowns and production lines slowed to a crawl as workers were forced to stay at home. In India, the government put restrictions on certain food fortificants like the B vitamins. They were reserved for the domestic market and could no longer be exported. Other countries like Egypt put restrictions on imports at the GPF, we had one consignment of potassium iodate that was ready to be shipped by sea from India to Egypt in March last year. It was shipped eight months later in November. At first, it was stuck in India because of a local lockdown, and then it was still stuck because of restrictions on the import of hazardous goods into Egypt. Between February and May 2020, we saw a 20% increase in sea freight costs. Shipping goods by air was also affected. As more and more passenger planes that could carry cargo were grounded, air freight prices took off. It became almost impossible to ship even small quantities of premix by air at a reasonable price. At the GBF, we saw huge price increases. For example, the cost of a shipment of vitamin A to Burkina Faso for oil fortification rose by 385%. And the prices of shipping, once quoted, became unstable. To give you an example, before COVID, sea freight prices were usually valid for 30 days. Today, prices are valid for seven. For air freight, it's even worse, with prices valid often no more than a couple of days. 
Later on in the year, it was difficult to move goods, but possible. The situation got worse in September, October, as we bumped into new problems. We had a third challenge then, I would say. So many containers were stuck in ports and so few new containers were being manufactured that there was now a shortage of containers in Asia. At the GPF, we had premix orders that were stuck in ports for weeks in Durban or Antwerp during transshipment. Let me give you a couple of examples. One consignment of wheat flour premix for K Verde was shipped from India and reached Antwerp in January. It was stuck there for two months. It is currently at sea and will only reach Cape Verde in May after five months in transit. The shape life of that premix is 12 months. So these disruptions are a major cause for concern. Another example, for our salt iodization programs in Ethiopia, Mozambique and Tanzania, we're seeing delays of about two months. In addition, potassium iodate is classified as hazardous goods, which requires a special approval from the shipping lines, but it's often not on the priority list. During this COVID crisis, the biggest challenge has been and remains supply chains. There is an EU funded study going on at the moment. And so far, their preliminary findings reflect our experience. The objective of this study is to provide an overview of the vulnerabilities in the food fortification supply chains. The French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development sent questionnaires to premix producers globally and they found that disruptions in premix production did not last. The largest challenge was transport and exchange rate fluctuations. On the positive side, around 50% of the respondents said that their businesses had seen an increase in demand and opened new markets. All the challenges I've mentioned are linked to COVID to the COVID crisis. And more recently, following the blockage of the Suez Canal, we are expecting further delivery delays and a surge in spot rates on the Asia-Europe trade. To conclude at GAIN, we're strengthening or setting up distribution systems so that food producers can have access to stock that is closer to them and readily available without relying on international supply chains directly. I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that later on, perhaps. But for now, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adeline. And thank you for reminding us the vulnerability of these large, long global supply chains um, for, for these premix um, for these premix deliveries and how that can affect even or have implications even for shelf life if these delays last for very long. Uh, and also for illustrating some possible solutions there. Uh, we will now hear from Josh, who has been working on, an, uh, on a live illustration of, the, of what has been discussed and presented so far. And I think you can now see it on your screen. Um, and Josh, maybe you can briefly describe what you've heard and what you've illustrated here. You have actually uh, illustrated it in the form of a supply chain, so that's very nice. Yes, uh, I thought the, the the, the visual of an actual chain made sense. So I've gone with that. And um, I've tried to capture some of the key points that have come up uh, so far. We've got the, the globe uh, in the top left hand corner of the image uh, being harassed and haunted by the COVID pandemic, which is creating shortage and delays. Um, and uh, as we could go along the, uh, the supply chain, the yellow chain, we can see your, your good self introducing the topic. Um, and then we see Leo saying, uh, we, I have to draw Leo in, but I've put his uh, uh, 
comments that a better alignment between the countries is key. Uh, then we moved on to talk about vitamin A and the, the ingredients and how important it is to, to, to uh, maintain a potency of the ingredients. Then we moved into the challenges for Asia and Africa, where I've tried to make some notes around uh, the key points there, availability, main stock, national regulation, and a domestic production. And finally, in the last, your last speaker, I'm just currently drawing a ship, uh, uh, container ship, uh, and there's a uh, speech bubble coming off the ship. And it's say, going to be saying that um, uh, the supply has taken five months uh, to arrive, and there's only a 12 months shelf life on the product. So that's all I've got so far, but I will be continuing to fill in the picture as I go. Yeah, this is this is um, this is wonderful, Josh, and I, and I think I would like to encourage all the um, all the people that are participating in this uh, in this webinar to please uh, submit some further suggestions and uh, and questions to Josh, so he can address those in the next round of this uh, of this illustration. I think also, Josh, for me, one uh, suggestion would be that this is a very nice illustration of all the all the challenges. I wouldn't. Uh, want to forget about also the solutions that the different speakers have already um, addressed to and the opportunities perhaps as well that we, that this you know this is not i mean this is not only a grim picture uh, due to covid but we have there are some solutions uh, there as well to uh, to come to more sustainable and resilient uh, supply chains so with absolutely this, I, i'll be saving the right hand side of the picture to put in the, oh, the positive great. message yes yes that's wonderful um, and uh, with this, you know, I would like to, um, to turn over now to some country uh, level experiences. Both are on uh, salt iodization, one from Mozambique and one from Bangladesh. I would like to uh, remind the audience that the speaker from Mozambique will, um, will do his presentation in Portuguese. So if you don't master Portuguese, you can, uh, you can listen to the live interpretation in English. You go to the interpretation um, tap on the bottom of your your screen and you will hear the the live uh, live um, interpretation of the, of the speaker we will first hear about father osorio and uh, he is the manager of the salina de batania enterprise uh, in mozambique and um, and then we will hear and he is um, that's one of the biggest salt producers in mozambique and in addition he's the president of the southern regional salt association a proposal since its creation in 2018. And we will then hear from Akhil Ranjan Tarafter, who is the general manager for the Bangladesh Small and Cottage Industry Corporation. And he manages the marketing department and is also project director for the project on the control of iodine deficiency disorders. We will first hear now of Father Carlos, who will um, have his presentation in Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, es para mí mucha alegría estar aquí, mucha alegría estar aquí con vos con esta, en este webinar. Eh, como ya dijeron, mi nombre es Carlos José Osorio, soy sacerdote misionario de Consolata, trabajo aquí en Mozambique y paso a gestión de una salina que se llama Salina de Batania. Más para além de eso, también eh, oriento como presidente a Asociación de Productores Comerciantes y Productores de Sal y Odado. Eh, hablaré un poco más sobre lo que es asociación como tal. Una vez que el propio proceso de asociación envuelve el proceso de cada salinero. También tenemos en cuenta que a nuestra situación en Mozambique es un poco particular. <coughs> Somos en town productores y comerciantes de sal yodado. Más somos productores de media escala, pequeña escala y microemprendedores. Eh, de salientar que una de las mayores características es que a nuestra producción es de tipo artesanal. Es de carácter artesanal, mmm, es todo feito, digamos, manualmente, no a nada mecánico salvo dos o tres industrias que son un poco mayores. Toda industria salinera de Mozambique 
está organizada en dos asociaciones. Una asociación que envuelve de, de Río San Vese a Teo Norte, se llama AISAL, y nosotros que estamos al sur del país, de Río San Vese a Teo Maputo, y nos denominamos como APROCOSAL. Así nos estamos sentados en Mozambique, eh, África Austral, y nuestra asociación de APROCOSAL cuenta con la participación de 66 salineros más seis pequeños grupos. Paso eh, a diferencia por qué. Porque los pequeños grupos son cinco pequeñas asociaciones de recolectores de sal de unas planicies que tenemos aquí en las, nuestras costas. Y un grupo eh, se está organizando, ellos eh, recogen sal en vuelta de una lagoa, que es una lagoa salgada, y allí hacen la recolla de su sal. Como a propio sal, tenemos algunos objetivos que pretenden orientarnos no nuestro caminar. Eh, representar los salineros, tanto de antes del gobierno como de otras instituciones que, que tienen alguna cosa a ver con la industria salinera. Es celar por la, la, por la cualidad, la cualidad de, de, de nuestro producto. No solo queremos cantidad, más cualidad que nos permita concorrer no mercado y ofrecer un producto de calidad al consumidor. También queremos promover la formación integral de nuestros salineros, la formación en la parte técnica, en la parte de gestión de la calidad, de gestión de recursos humanos, gestión de, de todo lo que tiene que ver con un pequeño negocio. También queremos promover las buenas prácticas, las buenas prácticas en la producción. Y queremos también cooperar como productores de sal junto a las organizaciones públicas, privadas, ONGs y todos aquellos que puedan eh, interagir con nosotros en esta cadena de producción. Podemos decir hasta aquí que como industria sanitaria en Mozambique nos encontramos en un proceso que es lento, más es un proceso en continuo movimiento. Eh, puedo decir que es lento porque a partir de 2018 que comenzamos a nuestra organización, hemos encontrado una serie de dificultades. Voy a enumerar algunas, como por ejemplo, muchos de nuestros pequeños salineros se encuentran en lugares sin vías que favorezcan la adecuación del producto. Eh, no tenemos hábito de trabajar juntos y este es un aprendizaje que, que estamos a hacer. Y tenemos también el eh, acceso a premis a yodo. Ten sido siempre una gran dificultad. Hace dos o tres años, el premis no será ofrecido gratuitamente por la UNICEF. Eh, después tenemos que comprarlo y ningún, ningún salinero sabía el camino para, para importar el premix, ya que el premix ven, normalmente vende a India, y no sabíamos su camino, nada de ese asunto. Así que estamos en un proceso de, de organizarnos, y a este momento, por ejemplo, eh, en esta semana está entrando en Mozambique, el primer cargamento de potasio de yodo, eh, ya eh, comprado por la asociación a través de GAME, con apoyo de alguien, se está a hacer ese, ese trabajo. Y la responsabilidad de la gestión y del buen uso de, de este premix es todo a, a responsabilidad de la de asociación. Otra dificultad es que, por el facto de no estar más organizados, eh, tenemos vivido eh, una concurrencia desleal muy grande entre nosotros propios y por parte de, de comerciantes. O termo un poco fuerte, más estamos en una situación con, que concurrimos con comerciantes bastante usureros, porque los precios que se aplican para el productor son muy diferentes de los precios que se aplican al consumidor. 
Ahora que está, eh, ¿cómo nos trabajamos para atingir nuestros objetivos y para hacer frente a estas dificultades que encontramos en el camino? La primera tarea que desenvolvemos es formación. Estamos a hacer formaciones, a, digamos, a todos los niveles, a nivel de organización, a nivel de gestión, a nivel de buenas prácticas para nuestro producto. Father Osorio, eh, ¿puedo a... ask you to wrap up? Father Osorio, ¿puedo a please uh, ask you to wrap up? The time is up. Thank you. Ok. Eh, Digo entonces, así por último, tenemos grandes parceros entre nosotros, que es AGAIN, ACTA, o Ministerio de Industria y Comercio. Y estamos a, a crear y a fortalecer una participación, una parcería que para nosotros es muy importante con la Universidad de Eduardo Mondrán, es la mayor universidad del país, que para nosotros es de mucha importancia eh, una parcería con ellos. Muy obrigado. Si hubiera después preguntas, estamos aquí. Thank you, Father Rosario. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry that I had to uh, interrupt you. Um, I will now hand, like to ha have. Um, um, I would now like to ask the experience, like to ask us to hear from the experiences in Bangladesh, by Akil Wanjan Tarafta, the manager for the Bangladesh Small and Cottage Industry Corporation. Akil, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I feel honored to be here. Uh, I am working for Bangladesh Small and Cottage Industries Corporation, uh, BISIC. BISIC is the prime of our organization in Bangladesh for, for fostering the growth of cottage, micro, small, and medium-sized industries. Uh, BISIC is the sponsoring authority uh, for the same. BISIC also acts as a sponsoring authority for salt industry in Bangladesh. We know iron deficiency disorders are recognized as a global health problem. The government of Bangladesh is officially committed to IDD elimination through national and international commitments. In 1989, the government of Bangladesh passed a law making it mandatory that all edible soil uh, salt must be iodized. The law stipulates that all salt of human consumption must contain 30 to 50 ppm of iodine at the uh, production level and 20 ppm uh, at the uh, retail level and 15 ppm uh, at the consumption, uh, consumption level. Accordingly, considering the importance of salt iodization, in 1990, a project was formulated titled Control of Iodine De Deficiency Disorders, that is CIDD, and implementing agency was BISIC under the Ministry of Industries, People's Republic of Bangladesh. We have been implementing the CIDD projects in eight salt zone covering 19 districts in Bangladesh. There were about 270 salt millers in Bangladesh. We are producing more than 2 million metric ton of crude salt every year and edible salt production is more than 1 million metric ton per year. As far as potassium, uh, procurement of potassium iodate, I'd li like to say that a revolving fund has been created for procuring pro potassium iodate with the help of our development partners like UNICEF, GAIN, and Nutrition International. BC creates this revolving fund for un uninterrupted potassium iodate supply to the salt millers at a minimum price. And as per, uh, in the case of uh, procurement process, um, we actually invite price quotations from our development partners. And after confirming the price proposal from development partners, a memorandum of understanding is signed between BSIC and the concerned development partner. However, as per our uh, DPP provision, of our project, we procure potassium iodate through our development partners. Last year and this year, we are procuring from the GAIN premix facility through GAIN. This is because it is less time consuming 
quality concern and price competitiveness. On the other hand, we can procure by uh, following uh, public procurement rules of Bangladesh, but this involves cumbersome uh, bureaucratic procedures, time consumption, quality, and price concern. And the distribution processes, we have uh, set up eight strong center at eight salt processing uh, salt zone uh, from where we distribute potassium iodate to the salt millers uh, countrywide. And challenges in procuring and uh, distributing uh, premix to salt producers, uh, I can mention there, there are various challenges in procuring and distributing potassium iodate like vendor selection, competitive price quotation confirmation, timely delivery, import procedure, approval process, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, sometimes salt millers are unwilling to pay prescribed price. And sometimes the containers are broken. So it should be maintained cautiously during transportation from the trans, uh, manufacturer's plant. BSIC has been uh, successfully implementing the universal salt iodization uh, program uh, through these uh, CIDD projects. Among the iodine deficiency disorders uh, like goiter, dwarfism, intellectual disability, miscarriage, and impaired intellectual development are significant. In the past, the prevalence of goiter was uh, noticeable frequently in Bangladesh. But now goiter and dwarfism have been significantly reduced due to the steps taken by the SALT Act and the uh, CIDD project since 1990. Now, goiter is not visible, but uh, iodine related other problems are still out there. So, salt iodization has a great importance. So, like our neighboring countries, we have made a remarkable progress in USA attainment. Now, we want to speed up the salt iodization program for achieving the 90% of USA attainment in Bangladesh. Since 1990, the project has been continuously contributing to create an intellectual nation by eliminating iodine deficiency disorders. So I would say th this project has a positive impact in direction of iodine deficiency disorders. So this is all about from me and I'll, uh, I'm ready for the next uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ashkan, and, and thank you for um, sticking to the time. Uh, and as you said, we will now move to the Q&A um, session. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see so many questions being raised by the participants, really demonstrating that this is a topic that's, uh, that's really of importance to, to you all and um, where you will have uh, many questions to the panelists. I would like now um, to see all the panelists coming on the screen. So we can, um, I can address some of the questions from the audience to them first. Um, and I think um, the, first, the first question is um, for Fikram, which is about um, how to make sure that premix qualities can be ensured after production and before use in the, in the mills. Uh, right. So uh, the question is, uh, how are premixes QC controlled rega regarding composition content um, after production in factory and before the using at the mill? So uh, the premixes are designed in a way that depending on what uh, uh, levels are required in the end product, that is the flour, uh, we design the premixes based on that and then arrive at a dosage. For example, 200 grams per metric ton, depending on uh, you know what are the ingredients and what are the levels required. Let's say iron, folic acid, zinc, and vitamin B12. So uh, we will blend in the appropriate uh, proportion, uh, adding some overages uh, to ensure that uh, the stability is maintained until the end of the shelf life. And after the production is done. We analyze the premix for the individual vitamins and minerals in the lab and find uh, make sure that the results that we obtain are in line with what is claimed on the label and uh, subject to um, you know the satisfactory results um, the premix is QC cleared 
and uh, good to go uh, to the flour mill. Thank you, Vikram. And uh, before uh, moving forward, I would like to remind all the panelists to please speak slowly so that um, also the translators can, um, can, can pick up and, and do the translation. Uh, I, th I think Vikram, you did a great, great job. It's just a general reminder. Um, there is also a question uh, for Leo, because you mentioned that the harmonization of premixes formulations uh, could be one of the uh, solutions to make um, uh, supply chain challenges less complex. Um, but where do you see the greatest potential to harmonize these premix formulations across a region? And what key factors need to be considered to achieve harmonization? And, 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 that, and an additional follow-up question is, do you have some exam uh, examples where this has been done successfully? Yeah. Um... I mean, I wouldn't want to point out um, a specific region. I think it's really a global um, topic that um, almost all, all regions, uh, whether it's in Africa or Asia, um, we, could, we could have some more um, harmonization between the, the countries. So it's not really that we have um, one, one prime example where it worked um, great, but I think almost everywhere we can um, yeah, become even better in the line, even a little bit more. Um, even though there are some, some um, countries who already move forward uh, in that regard, especially in East Africa, uh, I would say the East African standard, um, that works quite well. Um, and uh, yeah, still in, in, all, in all regions, I think um, there's a lot of value in trying to um, aligning a little bit more. And by doing that, actually reduce the variety in the different products that we have um, then in the market. Because then we, we suddenly gain, um, apart from the benefits we have for facilitating regional trade and such things, and maybe also making the QAQC um, easier for the, um, for the authorities, we also have the benefit of having um, on a supply chain uh, the option to maybe shift quantities um, between different um, countries. So think about a mill that maybe has ordered a bit too much premix, maybe another mill did not order enough premix, and then and uh, if we have a similar product used by all mills, we get the chance to yeah, shift them around and um, just really gain efficiency for these, for these programs. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also a question to Klaus because there's often um, um, confusion among the, among the public about the use of um, natural food fortifiers versus chemical substances. And, uh, are you aware of any research that's ongoing uh, currently for natural food fortifiers in premixes instead of chemical or manufactured vitamins and minerals? Uh, no, not really. This is one of my favorite uh, questions. Um, because if you look in nature, where is vitamin A present? It is only present in animals, not in the plant kingdom at all. So if you want to go for a source where you can, let's say, make natural vitamin A, you have to look to animal livers because this is the source with the highest content of vitamin A. And I made a quick calculation. If you take an average chicken liver with the average content of vitamin A and you want to extract the vitamin A to make one ton, only one ton of vitamin A, uh, containing 1.0 million international units per, per gram, you need to extract the livers of 288 million chickens. And hmm. that is simply not possible because uh, we are producing thousands of tons of vitamin A and uh, we are not the only one. So can you imagine the amount of chicken that should be, it is simply not possible. Uh, there are other attempts, of course, uh, making uh, some plant breedings with the uh, bitter carotene as pro vitamin A, uh, but I think that has longer perspective to, to solve. And of course, there's nothing that could be better than having uh, vitamin A in your natural food that you eat every day, but there's a long way to go. Yes, I can imagine. And uh, we, we would like to see these chickens uh, producing eggs that are also. Uh, Important, that would be, uh, that would be a solution for the hunger, I guess, yeah. <laughs> if we had all these chicken available. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, um, thanks, Klaus, for, uh, for addressing this question. Um, I would like now to move to um, our country experiences. And I have a question um, 
for Akil. Um, you you were have been you have been talking about the um, the iodine deficiency disorders or the control of iodine deficiency disorders project in Bangladesh. Can you briefly describe uh, what the objectives of the program are? And also, you've been illustrating already the success currently about the so, uh, universal South iodization program in um, in Bangladesh. But what are the opportunities to really achieve universal full iodization of salt in the country? Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we have been uh, implementing this project uh, for uh, uh, universal salt iodization program uh, for the attainment of 90% uh, USI in Bangladesh, like uh, other countries. Uh, the main functions uh, of this project uh, is to, uh, is to ensure the coverage of household consumption of adequately iodized salt from 51% to 90%. And other functions are to supply potassium iodide to the salt millers, uh, to provide them technical supports, logistic supports, R&D supports, and provide them also the law enforcement support to make sure that salt is properly iodized. And in terms of potassium iodide, I would like to say that at the beginning of this project, uh, we supplied potassium iodide to the salt millers free of cost. And afterwards, the uh, potassium iodide provided to the salt millers uh, on a partial payment basis. And currently, we are supplying potassium iodide uh, at a lower cost that is a government prescribed price uh, uh, in BDT 2,500 taka. That is uh, uh, 30, dollar, uh, 30 US dollars. So we are providing all sorts of supports to the salt millers in Bangladesh. Uh, the uh, only uh, because of the attainment of universal salt iodization in Bangladesh. And this CIDD project uh, has been uh, contributing tremendously uh, for attaining the USA in Bangladesh. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and I would also like to then ask Father Osorio, um, in, in Mozambique, there is a Salt Producers Association, as you have illustrated. How can an association really help to ensure a reliable, high quality, affordable supply, uh, in this case of potassium iodide required for the um, fortification of salt? I think you have to unmute yourself. Como sí, ya está. Como asociación, eh, uno de los principales objetivos es también contribuir para que la población tenga eh, o acceso a un salario. Eh, por eso estamos trabajando mucho en la práctica real y concreta de la ayudización. Uma vez que ao início disse que os nossos trabalhos são artesanais, então a judicação também fazemos de maneira artesanal e estamos trabalhando na formação de cada salineiro para fazer a judicação de forma correta conforme a normatividade que rige em Moçambique, que é de 25 a 55 ppm. Assim que outra luta que temos muito grande é a situação de embalagem, porque para que o, o sal chegue com a qualidade de iodo necessário ao consumidor, exige de uma embalagem que proteja o iodo corretamente. Eh, estamos nisso. Passar de um saco de rafia, por exemplo, para pequenos pacotes de, de plástico, que são aqueles que melhor aseguram o iodo. Aí também conta muito a cadeia de, de transporte, o, o manejo, o manoseio que fazem os transportadores do produto. En eso também trabalhamos muito nas salinas, eh, conversando com os próprios transportadores sobre a maneira de manipular o produto, de conduzirlo, de protegerlo no caminho. Não sei se respondi. Yes, I think so. Thanks, uh, Father Osario. And it also demonstrates the importance of having these alliances, particularly when there are smaller, smaller producers um, uh, in place. I would like to now move to a couple of the 
solutions that you have also raised in your respective presentations. Um, and I think uh, one of the solutions that two of you raised, which I found very um, interesting and haven't been really uh, uh, mentioned here so far, is the importance um, of the reliance on longer term relationships with, uh, with suppliers and ingredient uh, suppliers. And I think I found that uh, striking even in today's you know, world, it's still important that we have these strong, uh, strong relationships. Um, there are a number of questions uh, raised by the, uh, by the audiences on the solutions, uh, actually to the entire panel, uh, because one of the solutions that you have also been talking about was the uh, importance to establish local production have multiple uh, production sites. And I would, we would like to hear, particularly from the global producers and from Hexagon, what is your longer term vision for establishing these blending facilities in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America to reduce some of these logistical challenge, challenges that we have seen in the past year? Uh, maybe I can give the floor first to, um, um, to Leo from Stern. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I know that's a, that's a question that comes up um, very regularly in, in food fortification. Um, and of course, there's really a beauty in having the, the local production of premix in the countries where they also um, need it the most. Um, however, I'm not sure if that would um, really solve all the supply chain issues um, that we have. Because we would, of course, still, even if we had a premix uh, plant in a, in a given country, we would still need to um, get the single ingredients from different countries. So there's still like a lot of logistics involved to, to get the, the vitamins and minerals there. So it's not that suddenly all of the supply chain issues would, would disappear. So that's something I think we have to um, have in mind when we, when we think about that. Um, however, yes, I, I agree. It would be nice to have more sites, especially if you talk about Africa, um, have more production sites really on the ground and have some more of the, the value um, adding and the value chain also in the in the individual countries there. Right, Klaus, you want to comment on this? Yes, uh, I think it's very important also to it, uh, to understand this is also a, a, a delicate balance between uh, the economy of scale that you have big production somewhere, you have also lesser waste uh, as uh, we have in our factory, as I explained before. So having many, many small production places will not uh, necessarily make it easy for, for the supply. It will sometimes be much more complex. And, and Vikram, can you give a perspective from, from India, which is, of course, um, a large market, but how, you, how do you see this um, in the future? Right. Um, so uh, one I uh, personally feel is, uh, you know, uh, we, there has to be a regional uh, premix production uh, facility. Like, for example, um, you know, most of the African continent is dependent on um, exports from either Europe or Asia. So uh, uh, maybe a premix facility in East Africa, uh, one in South Africa, one in West Africa, that would definitely, uh, you know, bring down the lead times for supplying uh, premixes to the end consumers. And at the same time, I, I do agree with uh, Klaus that uh, we need to maintain the quality also. So we need to have the market size as well in order to uh, really invest in, in, in su such kind of factory. So uh, I think uh, if we have these regional uh, setup, uh, then uh, it would definitely add value, but not uh, I'm saying for individual country, that's not uh, practical. No, so if I hear all of you correctly, you say there's definitely um, um, a need and an opportunity to go more regional, but at the same time, we we'll have to keep the balance and, and maintain the economies of scale as well. So not go down to too many uh, local, uh, local production facilities. Uh, for the premixes. Um, I have a, another question that's also related to, um, um, to, to increase the availability of premixes in the countries. And it's a, a question I would like to ask uh, Adelan to comment on. Uh, so in countries where there's a huge shortage of foreign currencies, what can be done really to increase the availability of the, of the premixes? 
Yeah, that's um, that's a challenge. That's definitely uh, one of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, what I can tell you is what we're doing at the GPF level to um, help the food producers in terms of financial solutions. Um, so we are helping producers manage their cash flow and we have extended credit terms to clients who had not received their premix when their invoices were due, for example. Earlier, I spoke about 50 to 60 days of delay in terms of uh, delivery. Uh, we are extending uh, those credit terms uh, to food producers accordingly. Now, when it comes to forex challenges such, um, central banks have a role to play in terms of access to the Forex market. Um, there are solutions out there um, by uh, setting up distribution systems as we it's been mentioned before. Uh, we, yeah, we, we can uh, address those challenges, but we need all the stakeholders to really be involved in that. Okay, thank you. Um, Vikram, there is a question for you that relates to one of the solutions that was, was, was raised um, uh, is to further increase harmonization of standards. But yet um, in 2018, the Food Safety and Standards Agency of India, the, they changed the Indian standard for wheat flour fortification from standards that were aligned with the WHO recommendations to a new standard that had 17 times lower the amount of folic acid and 13 times lower levels of uh, uh, vitamin B12. So there's now concerns that this will make fortification less effective in preventing uh, severe birth defects like spina bifida and B12 deficiencies. So can you comment on that and what are your thoughts on this and how would this work if in future we would like to move towards more harmonization? Right, uh, so this is where uh, you know the point that I had mentioned in my in my presentation that collaboration between government agencies, private sector and the non-governmental organizations has to you know, um, get better and it is getting better. In fact, if you see uh, during the last few months, uh, we have seen the government agencies and the regulatory uh, authorities connecting with the industry through webinars and virtual meetings. Uh, in India, we see the FSSAI, that is the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, being proactive in several virtual interactions uh, with the food industry at large. And organizations like GAIN are playing an important role to facilitate such interactions in India, Bangladesh, and similarly, we have seen TechnoServe also being active uh, in Nigeria for such initiatives. So uh, I feel uh, you know the solution going forward uh, uh, to uh, correct these levels um, uh, you know to an appropriate uh, standard would be uh, you know have more interaction uh, with the government agencies and organizations like Gain in India. We have uh, Ms. Dipti Gulati who who is extremely active uh, in this area. Uh, so we need to uh, position these um, uh, these issues uh, appropriately in front of the FSSAI and take their support to get it implemented. Yeah, so if I hear you correctly, you're actually also um, saying that it's important to have advocacy as well um, and, and communications to our, uh, between international uh, NGOs and agencies and the government agencies to make sure that there is a continued case made for the importance of, uh, of food fortification in general and of certain specific standards in the formulation in particular to achieve some of the, um, the benefits. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, there is, um, um, I think, still room for one more question. Uh, and that's um, a question also to all the, uh, all the panelists because we have been seeing increased costs of these, uh, of the different ingredients and of the Premix, uh, premixes due to the challenges um, faced due to COVID. Um, have you also seen a decreased demand for premixes as a result? And is there evidence that this has impacted the price of fortified products? Um, I'm not sure who I could give the floor first on this. Uh, is there anyone of the panelists who has a specific opinion on this or specific experience to share? To share? Um, from maybe from the country, maybe maybe from Bangladesh, Ashkan. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, I think I think the question is whether the increases that we have seen in prices for the premixes and the ingredients of premixes due to all these uh, challenges in the COVID crisis okay. have they resulted into uh, an, an, an decreased demand for fortified products, and have they resulted in an increase in the price of fortified products? Uh, thank you. Uh, in case of uh, salt iodization, I would like to say that uh, uh, because salt is uh, uh, necess necessary commodities, uh, it is uh, been used by the uh, consumers every day. So uh, the uh, demand of salt uh, is not decreasing. It is uh, in the in the same line mm -hmm. uh, because consumers are consuming every day. Uh, so uh, in that case, the the uh, we are uh, sometimes we face the um, problem of pricing. Uh, during COVID situation, the um, international price is uh, increasing. Increasing. Uh, uh, one of our panelists uh, told in his uh, presentation that the price is increasing. So th that is uh, our problem uh, because in Bangladesh we are selling uh, potassium iodate. Uh, uh, 30 US dollar per kg. Uh, yeah, this is our prescribed price. But in terms of increasing of international price, um, uh, this is uh, somewhat burdensome for us to deliver, to supply uh, potassium iodide to the salt millers uh, at, uh, at our prescribed price. So uh, due, due to COVID situation, we are facing this problem. So if the uh, uh, international market uh, uh, becomes stable, in that case, uh, uh, we'll be, um, uh, we'll be uh, happier to uh, supply the product to the salt farmers. But uh, I would say that uh, the demand is not decreasing. This mm -hmm. is uh, same line as before. Thank you. Okay, that's... Uh... That's good to know. Leo, is there anything that you can say from the from the producer's side or the global producer's side? Have you seen a, who is, you know, what's happening with these prices and the demand? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> demand was also um, influenced in some countries by the, the COVID measures that were in place. So we've seen for, for um, some countries rather temporarily, um, there may be also the demand for fortification premises went down. So that was then when uh, when the production was was less, but usually that was only um, for a relatively short period of time, and then it uh, was was pretty much back to normal levels, I would say. So I, I would not necessarily have the, the feeling um, that it impacted the demand for fortification premises very strongly. Only very yeah, in a in a temporary way maybe. Okay. And and who's absorbing these uh, these pr these price increases? Is that throughout the chain or is that uh, at the consumer's end or more at the producer's end? I mean, we generally have a, a lot of fluctuation in the, uh, for many of the vitamins and minerals. So the pricing is really um, changing constantly. It's, it's, um, we often have to um, uh, adapt because I mean, all these um, different ingredients, they all have a, have a limited shelf life and the prices change. So, so uh, no company would have huge uh, a stock of a certain vitamin and use it up over maybe uh, three, four years or so, but you're constantly actually um, having an eye on the price and, um, and buying the ingredients um, as needed. And that means there's always uh, some fluctuation in the, in the price. And personally, I, I wouldn't say that this year um, there, were, there was a huge increase necessarily. Well, that's good because we do see um, an increased need, of course, due to COVID, to these type of solutions, um, with, uh, with you know, with um, an increase that we that we are going to see in micronutrient malnutrition due to the difficulties, uh, due to the economic crisis and the food systems issues, and uh, having you know reduced access to fortified foods. I would like to uh, thank all the panelists and the speakers of today. I think we, you really illustrated. Um, to, at least to me, and, and a, a, quite a, some new insights into the, the complex supply chains um, of these uh, of, that, that are, I think, critical to the success of fortification programs. I would like to also thank all the uh, participants 
uh, for your questions. And I realize we have not been able to, uh, to address all of your questions. Uh, we do apologize for that, but there are just too many to handle, which is great. I mean, it shows that you have a sincere interest in this topic. I think Oliver Camp from GAIN, he, um, he provided a link in the chat uh, that you can access if, in case you have uh, more questions and then they will be answered uh, after this webinar. But uh, before we go to the, um, the closing of the webinar, I would like to turn again to, the, uh, to, um, to Josh and, them, and showing us the, the illustration of the continuation of the, um, of the, of the, the webinar with, uh, with a few very nice uh, pictures, I think, of um, Akil and of Father Osorio talking more about um, uh, the country experiences, but also the Q&A session focusing more on the on the solutions and what we can do to more to move forward uh, and have more resilient supply chains um, that can be more resilient to future uh, future shocks including the chicken chicken livers i would like to um to ask all the audiences you know if you have some further comments or ideas on these uh, on this uh, very nice illustration then please um send them to us also in the link provided by oliver in the chat and uh, we, can, uh, we can build on this uh, for, uh, for future webinars. And we will definitely, of course, uh, share these uh, illustrations through the social media channels. And- um, Hello, uh, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, uh, in, in this infograph, uh, 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 something is written, 270 salt suppliers. Uh, uh, the correct one will be 270 salt millers, uh, those we are uh, supplying so, uh, potassium iodides. It will be salt millers. Yes, that's very, very good correction. And I see that uh, Josh is correcting it already thank as you, you speak. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> so let's, uh, let's him know in case of any further errors on this, uh, on this illustration, because obviously we want to make sure that it's correct, uh, and um, and I think um, it's it's um, a good illustration of the rich discussions and the rich uh, Q and A session that we've had uh, today in this um, in this webinar. So thank you very much uh, to all the speakers um, uh, again. Today, the webinar was the third in a series of monthly conversations on staple food fortification and leading up to the UN Food Systems Summit in September and the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit in December of this year, because we really want to make sure that we now are going to be very serious about scaling up large scale food fortification and tackling the challenges, including the challenges in the supply chain. There will be a next conversation and I would like to invite you to please join us uh, that will take place on April 29th, again at 2 p.m. Central European time. And this uh, webinar will focus on thinking regionally about industrial food fortification. So the webinar will take stock of progress made across regional economic communities and scope areas for future development. You can find more information on this series of webinars at the link that Kristen has put in the Q&A uh, chat or in the chat function. Uh, so you can find more information there on the, on the timings of the subsequent uh, webinars. All right. I would like to thank you very much again for being part of today's event and for being so active in the discussions. And we look forward to have you joining us again last, uh, later this month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Obrigado, obrigado.